Douglas was a distinguished professor of political science at K-State from 1949 to 1977. He was widely known for his power to inspire students, faculty, and citizens to instigate change. With principle, humor, and wisdom, he motivated grassroots organizations and individuals to pursue social justice in politics, economics, and foreign policy. His concerns were civil rights, racial and economic justice, voting rights, community organizing, fair campaign practices, and international peace. He was respected for his scholarly work, but he was really loved even by those who disagreed with him for his graciousness and his camaraderie, um, reaching out to not only friends, but to political uh, foes as well. He represented the highest standards of public morality and elicited our best impulses as citizens to strengthen democracy. Lou was also an influential member at UFM Community Learning Center, which in those days was called University for Man. He served on the board of directors in a number of roles uh, and as the chair of the board up until his death in 1979. Part of his commitment to grassroots projects got Lou involved in a project that uh, allowed legislation to be passed which started a program at UFM called the Community Outreach Program. Annually by the legislature and is administered by UFM and Kansas State University. It's a program that helps other communities around the state uh, set up their own grassroots community education, community development projects using their own model, using local talent and local resources and UFM serves as the consultant to them and has worked with over 90 communities in the last 25 years, helping them start their own uh, community projects. For all these reasons, UFM um, decided to honor Lou uh, with the lecture series in his name. And we try really hard uh, as part of the lecture series to adhere to his values and his interest areas, looking at civil rights issues, public policy issues, peace and justice. Last fall, the K-Stater magazine featured an article about Lou and his accomplishments at K-State, uh, which was very interesting for us because as a result of that article, we have gotten so many letters uh, and reminiscence about Lou and what an impact he made uh, on the students at that time. I think that told us as much as anything how greatly he was admired and even now, many years later, is remembered for some of the specific things he did to assist students on this campus. The lecture series is sustained by donations from individuals as well as K-State departments and colleges. And without their help, the series would not be able to provide the number and quality of speakers that we've been able to uh, bring to the K-State campus in the last 25 years. And for all of its availability, uh, because Forum Hall was not always here. Uh, but for its availability, Forum Hall has essentially been the home of the lecture series. Uh, almost every uh, Lou Douglas lecture has been held in this room. And with the gracious support of Bernard Pitts, Jack Connaughton, the Union Governing Council, and with the design work of Jeff Smith, uh, I would like to unveil tonight a plaque honoring our lecture series honoring Lou and honoring the individual donors who have really made this series function. Um, in the next couple of weeks, it will be mounted in the foyer of Forum Hall as a permanent addition um, to this space. And we're extremely appreciative and proud of that happening. Thank you. Um, I'd like you to join us in the foyer following the lecture where you can get a close look at the plaque. We have refreshments available and you'll have an opportunity to visit with our guest speaker for the night. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce John Flyter, who is a professor of political science and also the chair of the advisory board for our lecture series, who will introduce tonight's speaker. John? Thank you, Linda, and good evening, everyone. 
Our speaker, Stephen Douglas, hasn't lived in Kansas for about 45 years, and yet he still considers Kansas his home state. He tells people that this is where he's from. Stephen Douglas resided in Manhattan, Kansas from 1948 to 1960. Those were the early years of Professor Lou Douglas's tenure at Kansas State University in the political science department. And along with Stephen's two sisters, they had a unique perspective on his father's extraordinary role in the social and political development of the community. After graduating from Manhattan High School in 1956, Douglas enrolled at Kansas State University, majored in, majored in political science, and graduated summa cum laude in 1960. I learned the other night at our scholarship banquet for the political science department that uh, Lou Douglas was Stephen's advisor within the political science department. Somehow, Stephen managed to avoid taking a class from his father, even though there were only three political science professors in the department at that time. While a student at K-State, Stephen Douglas played on the varsity basketball team, starting at a guard position in the 1958-59 to team, which posted a record of 25 wins and two losses. I believe they were number one for most of the year. Those were the days when K-State actually beat KU. Even when those Jayhawks had a player named Wilt Chamberlain. Also, in 1959 to 1960, Stephen Douglas served as the president of the K-State student body. Douglas earned a PhD in political science at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and subsequently served as a faculty member at that institution until his retirement in 2000. His research and teaching during that uh, time focused on political change in Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia and Malaysia. He and his late wife, Sarah, also a K-State graduate, lived in Malaysia and Indonesia for six years. Most of Stephen Douglas's public publications include two books, including two books, deal with politics in that region. He's also published in the area of sports and society and politics. A re reflection of his experience as a student at KSU and further experiences coaching the national women's basketball team in Malaysia. And he also has written on serving as the first coach of the women's varsity basketball team at Illinois. Upon retiring, Douglas accepted a position as director of a newly established living and learning community at the University of Illinois. The community called Global Crossroads is oriented toward programming and service for students with international living experience and career interests. There will be a brief question and answer session after the lecture. We're gonna give uh, everyone a couple of minutes to exit if they need to leave early. But I encourage you to stay for the question and answer session. And uh, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you to please welcome uh, Stephen Douglas to Kansas State University. Thank you, John, and uh, thanks to all of you for attending this evening, and uh, to many of you for being loyal supporters of the Lou Douglas Lecture Series. Uh, I'll have a few more comments about that a little later. I wanted to jump right into the uh, substantive topic that I've chosen for tonight. When I was asked to speak, um, we were beginning to hear for the first, this was a few months ago, we were beginning to hear for the first time the phrase ownership society as part of the um, opening debate, this was prior to the, uh, the two major party conventions last summer, part of the opening uh, debate about social security reform, and I'm sure the phrase ownership society is familiar to most of you. Uh, it's a bit of political rhetoric that I want to explore, and this will be a modest um, endeavor, uh, but perhaps it will be of some use to you later. Uh, that's part of my intention, to give you a way of thinking about uh, politics and political language that uh, should be applicable in uh, many other contexts. The importance of language in politics is fairly obvious, but I nevertheless want to give credit to a former professor of mine, Murray Edelman. He was a professor in political science at the University of Illinois, 
who uh, developed a mode of analysis um, uh, with a focus on uh, linguistic symbols, which uh, I've always found very insightful, a little difficult to work with, not quite sure where to go with it, but uh, it's loaded with insights, and, and I hope I can persuade you of that this evening. Um, the book that you'll want to look at if you want to follow up uh, my presentation tonight would be a book entitled Political Language, and the subtitle, Words That Succeed, Poli Policies That Fail, pretty much sums it up. Words that succeed, policies that fail. Sometimes words and policies succeed, as in the case, I think, of Social Security. Social Security, as crafted and sold as part of Roosevelt's ambitious policy changes during the Depression, um, worked. The term worked and the policy worked. Murray Edelman, a brilliant, catch this, a brilliant and otherwise typical pro-New Deal social scientist of his era, used business regulation, not social security, to illustrate his argument. Would he have used ownership society for the same purpose? No doubt, yes. Each of them except the last, a residence owned and rented out by somebody else. As I reflected on this in preparing for this talk, it dawned on me that not only is the preference to rent a comment by and on Lou Douglas, but so is the more precise location of the six houses. So I'm going to give you a rundown of where we live in Manhattan. First, we lived at 615 Humboldt. Uh, like several of the other addresses, it's now a place where there is no house. Um, there is a bank or a parking lot or some other testament to Manhattan's progress. Uh, the house, which was a beautiful house, is long gone. But when we lived there in the late 40s and early 50s, um, the lot and house at 615 Humboldt were in the shade of the massive First Methodist Church, one of the impressive um, architectural landmarks of a civic nature in this city. At least I always thought so, especially when I was uh, 11 or 12 years old. That church impressed me. I mean, that was a big, beautiful building. I went by, uh, over the last couple of days, I've revisited Manhattan. I've gone by, taken another look. It still is. Our next home is at the corner of 14th and Points, catty cornered from the very public city park where I spent a good portion of my time with other kids who like to run and jump and swim. So uh, this is the uh, beginning of a pattern I want you to catch. On, hum on Humboldt Street, we live uh, adjacent to a big, if not technically public institution, a, a civic associational uh, structure at uh, 14th and Points, uh, an address, incidentally, that was missed by about half a block by the flood in 1951. Um, at 14th and Points, we live right across from the city park. From there, we moved a couple of blocks to an address on Houston Street, just across from a public school, Roosevelt School, if I'm not mistaken. Our fourth home in Manhattan, across the viaduct east of town, was something of an exception insofar as it was not adjacent to a public or civic institution or facility. It was owned by Mr. Sape, who also owned the beer warehouse next door on the property. Uh, so dad's record of selecting houses that were close to or even part of publicly owned property was imperfect. Although a beer distributorship somehow symbolizes his affinity for the proletariat better than, say, a supermarket would have. <laughs> Next we moved up, maybe, <laughs> to a house on Claflin Road directly across Goodnow Hall, across from Goodnow Hall. The house is no longer there. It's a convenience store. Uh, but uh, Goodnow Hall is there. So you know where I mean if you're familiar with this community. And uh, so once again, we were back adjacent to public uh, property and institution um, within the orbit of public places, namely, namely, finally, Kansas State University. Few of you may recall the cross-burning incident that occurred at that house in 1961. My younger sister was dating an African-American uh, kid while she was in high school. And a couple of students from Goodnow Hall chose to uh, ignite a very large cross. I wasn't at home at the time. 
I was off at graduate school in uh, the front yard. Um, the perpetrators of that event, as I said, resided in Goodnow Hall. And conceivably, that event was a factor in my parents' radical decision a couple of years later, after more than 30 years as renters, to buy a house. Since Dad once stated that he was proud to have been targeted by crossburners, it's more likely he and my mother were persuaded by do-gooders like me, who thought uh, there were some financial advantages to buying a house, and we told Dad that. Um, I mean, we didn't argue that necessarily home ownership was morally virtuous, but we did argue there were some advantages. Maybe that was more of a factor than the cross burning, I don't know. But anyway, um, although he was notoriously lax about managing, much less accumulating wealth, he did not hesitate to try new styles and approaches, viewing his own life as something of an experiment in social adjustment and political adventure. So finally, he bought a home the home that was to be his sixth and last residence in Manhattan. Once again, it was adjacent to a public facility. Those of you, a lot of you remember that house. It was at uh, Oakdale Drive, at the south end of Oakdale Drive. Being at the south end, that put it, again, adjacent to a public facility. Uh, in this case, I don't know what to make of the symbolism. It, it's Sunset Cemetery. Um, but we liked that house. Dad and the rest of the family liked the house on Oakdale Drive, and it seems unlikely to me, it seems unlikely that we, including him, would have liked it any less if we had been renting. He didn't particularly enjoy maintaining the house, and it's even conceivable that he felt less obliged to do so since it was his and not somebody else's. Still, the presumed fact, this is a fact in quotes, that owners care for property better than mere tenants is accepted as common knowledge in our society and in these times. The evidence rarely is considered very carefully, and in any case, consider this. Most property owners, most, sorry, most property, whether rented or not, has an owner or owners. When rental property becomes dilapidated, the problem may not be that there is no owner. In fact, there is an owner. There is an owner who is failing to keep the property up. Surely the absentee landlord is as culpable as the tenant. At least, often that's the case. I mean, the common, so the fact, in quotes, that uh, renters don't give a damn is dubious at best. I mean, why all of a sudden do we give owners credit for maintaining property? Renters get all the discredit for letting it run down. The real, you know, the more intelligent thing to say about this is that probably there is a synergistic effect between owning in a place and living in a place. And if you do both, uh, yes, you probably feel a greater stake in maintaining the property and, um, and that makes sense to me. But it doesn't make sense in every case to jump to the conclusion that rundown property is rented property and it's the renter who's at fault. Actually, of course, the whole argument is a bit beside the point of Bush's current ownership campaign anyway. He's not advocating home ownership just now. He does sometimes advocate home ownership, but the, the debate I wanted to be talking about here is social security reform. Um, the ownership society rhetoric is aimed at social security reform. The idea is that people will take responsible for their own, or rather owned, property and a more direct connection of this sort between the individual and her or his retirement program will somehow be good for everyone. Never mind for the moment whether it can be good for everyone in similar and equal fashion, given what we know about the distribution of wealth, this question and the insight guiding it are not new. It was James Madison, in fact, who incisively and permanently injected this issue, the question of equality or inequality of distribution of wealth, into American political discourse when he said, the most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property. 
He went on to say subsequently that in fact that would be what brings down the republic, the extreme concentration of wealth, which he saw even in his day, and uh, believe me, it was not as extreme then as it is now. The failure of the administration to address the issue of inequality is neither new nor acceptable. But let's, uh, let's let it lurk for a moment in the wings of this discussion as we take up the responsibility issue. Uh, here there is an odd reversal of arguments for, via the Patriot Act and centralization of security programs and increased government spending, the administration seems to say that effectiveness and honesty and care require government ownership. Large-scale public policies that only a government can coordinate with regard, for example, to security. Not social security, security. This is not far from my own view that public policies implemented by public agencies provide a degree of accountability and capability or capacity that private ownership does not. There are some things corporations can do. There are some things corporations can't do as well as they must be done. Public ownership is most relied upon when the stakes are largest and the problems most challenging. One thinks of the TVA, the Manhattan Project, and such public health campaigns as controlling polio. So it's worth noting that most of the criticism the president is receiving on this topic comes from his right rather than from his left. At this stage, the thrust of the ownership concept in regard to Social Security, however, has more to do with how Bush's hypothetical worker, he talks a lot about a worker or the worker, feels about his or her private account rather than how well that account actually does in the market. That is, how does the worker feel about the account? That's, what, that's the argument in favor of ownership. He or she the worker is going to feel good about the account. The argument isn't much to the effect that the account's going to do better. In fact, the market becomes more of a casino. Um, the economy becomes more volatile as time passes. And, and a lot of us sense that. And the whole argument about ownership tends to uh, leave us a little bit unpersuaded not just because of our philosophical ambivalence about ownership, but also because of our growing realization that uh, that, that bit of our so-called private property, that bit of social security that we're going to control and manage ourselves uh, isn't a sure thing. Just as the president's men think the right words, let me make sure I'm picking up in the right place here, uh, let's back up. At this stage, the, thr the thrust of the ownership concept in regard to Social Security has more to do with how Bush's hypothetical worker feels about his or her private account rather than how well that account actually does in the market. Just as the President's men think the right words will win support for the program, words that succeed, they expect the program itself to evoke a warm, fuzzy feeling among its participants. That would be a policy that succeeds, too, if we feel good about it. There's little sign that this will happen, and that, I believe, is because the rhetoric falls short, which in turn is a result of the very realistic view of ordinary people in the electorate. Granted, some media have contributed sharp critiques, hostile phrases such as unsocial insecurity, to describe Bush's proposal, to the dialogue, but even absent such low-key opposition, ownership is not the great motivating notion that it was expected to be. Ownership turns out to be a word. This is just my view, and I'd be interested uh, to see to what extent any of you might disagree. Ownership turns out to be a word that is not as positive in, its, in all its connotations as it was expected to be. It makes me think a little bit. This whole method of analysis of uh, political language makes me think of a story I heard recently, also involving an attempt to use language to evoke good feelings. Um, this involves the case of the young man who learned a few magic tricks, was on his way to becoming a pretty good magician, he thought, and 
uh, in the process, inadvertently went a little far, turned his wife into a sofa and his children into chairs. Um, when he realized what he'd done, of course he tried to reverse the spell, failed immediately. It didn't work. He rushed them to the emergency room to get a little help from somebody who could help. Uh, the doctor should, said, uh, sure, I'll take care of it. Disappeared into the uh, operating room with the, with the family, the wife and kids, um, the sofa and chairs. Came back out and uh, very quickly came back out. And so uh, the man was relieved to see that it all had uh, transpired rapidly. He said, okay, how are they? The doctor said, they're comfortable. Uh, it's a use of language uh, not too different, maybe, from ownership societies. Um, it's most obviously the case that ownership isn't working as a very positive political uh, symbol and concept because so many people doubt their prospects of becoming owners on any significant scale. It doesn't do much for ordinary laborers, the ordinary folks that Bush is talking about and trying to appeal to. It doesn't uh, do much for them to tell them they're going to own a, a little piece of their, of their retirement fund, of their social security. With limited retirement funds already a reality, the introduction of the element of risk accompanying privatization of Social Security is too great a price to pay for the alleged advantages of ownership. Recent history of the stock market and the economy more general does not help Bush make his case, nor does the rest of contemporary economic reality. Departing for a moment from my emphasis on presidential rhetoric, let me just observe that the background to the speeches and essays about ownership is a hugely skewed distribution of wealth in which it is primarily the richest 2% of taxpayers who continue to benefit most from the administration's policies. When ordinary wage earners, school teachers and firefighters, for example, get a pay raise, they must pay disproportionately considerably more in new taxes than does Donald Trump when he decides to sell $20 million worth of stock. Nearly half of the country owns no stock at all. The great majority of those who do hold it in retirement accounts, they don't sell, they don't sell it regularly and buy. Uh, they hold it in 401ks. Eventually, we'll all have to pay taxes on the portions of those funds that we withdraw for retirement. It makes us, that makes us ineligible for the capital gains tax, which applies only to stocks bought and sold outside of retirement funds. And consider owners of large patent monopolies. Who do I have in mind here? Obviously, uh, especially uh, large drug companies. By virtue of the new Medicare prescription drug benefit and the provision preventing the government from negotiating lower prices, these companies um, and this set of owners wins a huge economic benefit at a great cost to us, the taxpayers. So it might be said that Bush is indeed encouraging an ownership society, but mainly for the 5% of Americans who own, who own. I could have stopped there. But let's say the 5% of Americans who own the majority of the country's wealth. The poorest 40% own 0.2% of the country's privately owned wealth. And as wealth increasingly is shielded from taxes, inequality will become more entrenched and more hereditary. Bush's ownership campaign just might be seen as a step toward government of the owners, by the owners, and for the owners. Since most people understand that as wealth becomes more concentrated, so too does political power, the really key question is whether Bush's rhetoric can succeed in promoting an uncritical view of ownership. If we're led to perceive ownership as a criterion of responsibility and good citizenship, and if we seek to fit into such a system by asserting and enhancing our status as owners, we risk demonstrating the validity of Edelman's most provocative insight. That insight might be stated this way. To accept the regime's language is to buy into it. To buy into it is to submit to it. To submit to it is to be co-opted by it. To be co-opted by the people who speak it. The rhetoric makes it easy enough for ordinary citizens to feel empowered. 
simply by virtue of owning stuff within which concept retirement accounts probably are second in importance only to houses. It's important. A retirement account is important. Um, so in that sense, they're on the right track. They're talking about something that counts. But for reasons I've, I hope I've made clear, uh, I don't think it's where. Of course, the record by now, I chose this topic a few months ago. I wasn't sure what I would say. Now it's pretty clear what should be said. It didn't work. Um, I'm not saying that this administration will fail altogether to achieve any reform of Social Security. Social Security needs some attention. It needs some change. I'm not an expert on that, and I do hope. Actually, I share what President Bush says his hope is. That is, it, it will receive some serious attention. There will be some cooperative interaction among uh, politicians from both parties. Something will get done. I don't think it's nearly the crisis that uh, we've been told. It is not nearly the crisis that we have in the field of medical care, uh, health care delivery. Um, if there's a crisis in American public life, that's where it is. Um, and that's what needs some attention. Earlier, I suggested that Edelman would have approved selection of ownership as a lingu linguistic gimmick worthy of analysis. One reason I believe that to be the case is that the discussion of Social Security reform has been framed as urgent. Um, I just made that point. I, I'll skip over the rest of what I had to say about that. One advantage of ownership to the administration, ownership as a, as a political symbol, is that it's not a lofty criterion of citizenship or participation. During the 80s and 90s, uh, a lot of us became owners even of um, some of our retirement uh, resources, even if we didn't participate directly in a, uh, in a retirement program, uh, those you know, IRAs became available and, and a lot of people became owners in that sense. No vast restructuring is required unless all owners are to be large-scale owners, and that's not what's being proposed, unless that is a significant redistribution of wealth is going to happen. But not only is that not part of the plan, the restructuring of Social Security as proposed by this administration probably would have the opposite effect. At least it's safe to say that the trend toward concentration of wealth is not part of the problem as seen by the administration. If voters had accepted the ownership argument in an uncritical display of allegiance to their leaders, the plan to privatize would have proceeded apace. The fact that it did not happen and appears not to be happening at least in the near future, bodes well for democratic participation in the United States, in my opinion. Orderly compliance in the form of accepting the ownership argument would have signaled a disturbing lack of awareness, a, a disturbing lack of awareness of symbol manipulation or an unhealthy willingness to go along. Independent thought and action usually are not the first and easiest option. From a systemic point of view, one favoring stability and order Mass approval of the symbols of the day, which didn't happen in this case, would have concealed conflict and assuaged anxiety. It didn't happen. We've still got conflict. A lot of people are still anxious about Social Security. But on the other hand, skepticism, which has happened, about such symbols undermines co-optation. It keeps us free. Provides, and provides a more meaningful basis for political participation. And, uh, and I have no doubt that uh, if my dad had been delivering this speech instead of me, uh, it, would have been, it would have been a lot more hard-hitting. And um, if, I, if anything I have said has, been, uh, has left you wondering, where exactly does he stand? Uh, that's OK. That's me. Uh, that wouldn't have been him you would have known where he stands. Thanks for being an attentive audience. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, uh, we're going to have some questions here uh, in a moment. But we're also going to pause for a couple minutes in case anybody needs to leave. Thank you. I was going to say, uh, 
uh, the faculty who assigned this lecture as a requirement forgot to say, you have to stay for the question and answer period. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's fine. I understand that. I didn't used to say that either. I'd, I mean, it's enough torture to have to sit through the lecture. <laughs> but uh, for those of you with uh, fortitude and courage to stay on, do you have any questions for me? I'm wondering what your assessment is of the role of the AARP in uh, making a case for the other side, which is in their TV ads, you don't tear down the whole house in order to fix the drain that doesn't work in the sink. A very visual kind of a thing which, which makes sense to people. If the AARP hadn't launched that campaign to try to counter the very slick language manipulation which this administration is using, would there have been a debate about this? Because it seems to me that the usual political mechanisms to do it, that is Democrats and progressives and others, just weren't getting through. Isn't it the AARP that has made this thing into something of a fight? Well, I, and I don't really want to belong to the AARP even though I'm eligible. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I didn't hesitate. Uh, what do you get, 15% off at uh, Quality Inn or something like that? Um, I understand. Yes, it's huge. I don't know to what extent the AARP's campaign um, has been effective. Actually, I've heard about those commercials. I think I may have seen one. I'm more familiar with uh, what the AARP has done in their publications. For some reason, I always browse through there looking for coupons, I guess. Um, but um, in their publications, they have had some fairly reasoned uh, articles which um, are even somewhat balanced. That is, uh, they purport to state a little bit of the administration's case, but they clearly come out against um, the, the privatization type of reform. Uh, they, do have, they do advocate uh, serious attention to um, long-term uh, revision somehow of Social Security so that it will be more enduring and more uh, stable. I, d I don't know to what extent um, that has been a key factor. I really sense that um, from the very beginning, ownership society fell flat. And I think it's for the reason uh, that I tried to put my finger on initially with those quotes from uh, really honored literary sort American literature and uh, other places. I mean, a lot of very insightful people have tapped into our, um, our resistance, our built-in resistance, which isn't always there, but something activates it a lot of the time as sort of cantankerous individuals. The president is not going to push us in a direction we don't want to go, and we're ambivalent about ownership, and um, it's not clear that this is meaningful ownership anyway. It's a, it's a sort of peculiar use of the word, so uh, I just think there, was, there turned out to be uh, a sort of visceral resistance, which had more to do with the failure of the words, ownership society, than than with any, than, than with the AARP's campaign specifically on uh, television. But that's just my guess. I, I don't know. I'm certainly, uh, I'm happy the AARP uh, weighed in. Yes. I have a uh, question that um, strikes me about um, the concept of ownership. It seems to me that my generation and my parents' generation viewed social, viewed social security as something that they owned. It was an entitlement, but it was also something that nobody would dare take away from them. And I, I'm wondering if the miscalculation on the part of the Bush administration wasn't that people already felt that they owned social security, and that in the first place, calling into question whether the social security system would survive, and secondly, uh, 
trying to bring in the privatization, which seemed like a step back from ownership, uh, isn't the reason that they, it really seems to have fallen somewhat flat. I hadn't thought of that. That's, a, that's an interesting possibility. Um, if it was, you know, if, if we think of it as something we already own, then it rings pretty hollow to present a uh, reform in terms of the phrase ownership society. Um, I don't know so much about what my generation thinks. I'm not sure you do either, because I know where you worked. <laughs> this is, uh, he's a colleague of mine from the University of Illinois, and we do not participate in Social Security. Um, so, so, of course, in that sense, I don't feel like I own any <laughs> Social Security, but um, I know what you mean, and uh, that's, that is an interesting possibility. And there's a lot of discussion in the AARP uh, debates and elsewhere about differences between generations. Uh, and, and the AARP has argued that Bush and his advisors attempted blatantly to divide the opposition by making appeals to, making different kinds of appeals to some age groups that would fall flat with others, but they knew, but they hoped that would, uh, you know, be a way of dividing and ruling the opposition. And it probably is true that very young people now, well, it must have been true at any point in American history, young people grow into a perception of Social Security which changes over the, over the, the years of their life. And uh, it'd be interesting to know more about how that tracks. Uh, I don't purport to know much about it, but it's an interesting point. Um, yes. Just about your opinion on kind of in this day and age of everyone. Sorry. Um, just in this day and age of everyone having a PR person and the language manipulation that's used in these successful words, um, and just how you're describing the the top two percent of of the nation being benefited most by um, the Republicans' plans, that how the Republicans have basically fooled the working class into believing that they're the party for them, and just how the language manipulation and the successful words plays into that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why we study it, because uh, there is no doubt it does play into that, and it, and it often tends to work. But, but I guess maybe one reason I was, I was happy to study this particular issue, it not only seemed that ownership society wasn't working, that particular phrase, but it's clear that the administration has backed off uh, the use of the word private. They were talking about private uh, accounts, and uh, they dropped that like a hot potato, and they're talking about personal accounts now. The, the word evidently works better. Uh, they find that out in their focus group research and so on. Um, but they've just had, they're, they're stumbling around a bit on this particular issue. Um, you ask a much larger question, though, and um, it could be that, to some extent, politics gets reduced, especially every four years, to a kind of battle of rhetoric um, and symbol manipulation. And we're not very good at, uh, I don't think political scientists have been a very, done a very good job of studying that particular phenomenon. Um, so it was my hope in, in focusing on it tonight to get people, especially political science students, a little bit more interested in it. Yes. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask if you thought maybe, uh, I get the feeling sometimes that Bush and his cronies are not using ownership to sell this change to Social Security so much as using Social Security Form to sell the whole idea of ownership. You know, it seems like oftentimes they do things to support their larger view of the world and not so much, you know, these individual policies are not about that important to them all the time. It seems like um, if you can get people fighting about this word ownership, there are a lot of things that 
you know, the people do resonate with that, and uh, they just don't ask questions about, like, well, who owns the media? Who owns, you know, who controls the public parks? Who control, you know, the use of natural resources and so forth? And almost, uh, like, this is a smoke screen for uh, some of these larger issues, I think. I don't know, what do, you, what do you think about some of those ideas? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I actually do think that um, it, is, it is partly a, if not philosophy of life, at least a big, a big uh, part of the worldview of many people in this country that ownership is crucial. What I own um, is sacred. That, that was the word uh, used in one of these quotes. Um, um, but it, I really think most of us, most of us, uh, own, own enough and we feel we, we're, we're kind of uh, sure we own enough and it's not an issue. It's kind of, the issue is more beyond what we own, what, what else is out there in life? What else can be done and what needs to be done and uh, how can it be done? And it's not clear that further ownership by the people who already own a lot or people who don't really own much, it's not clear that further ownership is much of a solution to anything. I mean, it's hard to imagine how health care reform, which as I said earlier, I think is really the critical issue in the United States, it's hard to imagine how ownership is going to uh, solve that. Uh, it's going to have to be a public program of some kind. And to the extent that it's owned, to the extent that it involves ownership, it will surely be uh, collective ownership to some extent. And I think people, uh, you know, they, we don't fully grasp what that means, but um, I think that is in the back of our minds. But you may be right that um, the whole ownership concept is more important to the administration than Social Security reform. Social Security reform uh, isn't quite so... Uh, you know, if, this, if this administration fails to achieve Social Security reform, you know, since I've already said, I don't think it's a, a crisis at this point. Um, if other people agree with that, then a failure to solve it right now is not going to... Um, be a terrible black mark against Bush in, you know, in the historical record. So it may be they care more about ownership. This is just an opinion question, but do you think that's why he's ta ta uh, tackled Social Security rather than Medicare? Or is it because he is helping you know, the, the, corp uh, the powerful interests in this country by wanting to privatize Social Security. Uh, <laughs> Could you hear me? <laughs> sure, I, yeah, I could hear you. Uh, his, his concern was that everybody else hear you. Well, the question was about whether um, Bush was more, is more interested in uh, benefiting private interests through the reform of Social Security than actually shoring up the program. And, and does that also help explain why I didn't address uh, medical, the medical care crisis. Um, the, the argument that Social Security form, as proposed by the administration, would benefit mainly uh, banks and other uh, investment-related institutions um, isn't terribly compelling to me only because I don't know to what extent that's true. Uh, there's a certain logic to it, which is, which is pretty clear and obvious. But I really think the reason for targeting Social Security is um, he thought it would be very popular. He thought it would be an extremely popular uh, campaign. Uh, and, he, and, and why not health care? Because that looks really intractable. 
That, how, how do you get a handle on that? Um, as Hillary Clinton discovered, it ain't easy. No, of course not. Um, but, it, but it may mean that any given administration will tread very carefully. They don't have to tackle anything, you know. In a way, um, they can wait until they get voted out if we vote them out. Any other questions? I'd like to uh, reiterate that um, on behalf of my family, really, that we are uh, so appreciative of the support this community has given to the Lou Douglas Lecture Series. Um, I hope I can uh, return to uh, be part of the audience for uh, some future lectures. And uh, thanks again for being part of it as the audience here tonight. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. And please join us in the foyer for refreshments.